Hi class, this is Professor Hunt, and this module we are going to be reviewing Chapter 1 of the Melnick book titled Making the Case for Evidence-Based Practice in Cultivating a Spirit of Inquiry. Before going any further, though, we must understand the components of evidence-based practice. These are the three pillars of what makes up EBP. The first is external evidence from research evidence-based theories, opinion leaders, and expert panels. This is the research that you will be doing through your literature reviews. The second is clinical expertise. In this, the examples of this might be internal evidence generated from outcomes management or quality improvement projects, a thorough patient assessment and evaluation, or the use of available resources at your site. The last component of evidence-based practice are patient preferences and values. Again, all three of these pillars make up the components of evidence-based practice, and it's important to consider each one of these as you move on to your decision-making and dissemination of your project. One of the first pillars that I talked about was the use of external evidence, and I talked about literature review. So different types of external evidence specifically include evidence generated through rigorous research like we talked about, systematic reviews, evidence-based theories, national benchmarks, or, and opinion leaders in expert panels. Internal evidence is a little bit different and is generated through such things as practice initiatives, including outcomes management and evidence-based quality improvement projects. It includes patient assessments and evaluations. And lastly, it includes the use of available resources within your organization. So you're gonna hear the term EBP a lot, but knowing the definition and understanding the foundation of evidence-based practice is vital before we move on to anything else. So there is a big difference between evidence-based practice, research, and quality improvement. And knowing the differences between these three things is important because they are similar to a certain extent. So first, let's talk about evidence-based practice. EBP is a decision-making process, again, those three pillars that we talked about. It's based on a body of evidence that has been identified, critically appraised, and synthesized. And we're gonna be doing all of these things. We're gonna identify a body of evidence, we're gonna critically appraise it, and then we're gonna synthesize it. EBP is also generating new knowledge about practice through implement implementation of evidence-based recommendations. It's not generalizable, but rather transferable, meaning, you should be able to identify an evidence-based need at a practice and tra transfer that same knowledge to another practice. Sometimes requiring submission to the IRB is important. And note, this actually varies from organization to organization. So not everyone needs IRB approval, but some EBP implementation projects do require this. It's very important to understand the difference between research and evidence-based practice. Now, the primary difference is the fact that research tests a hypothesis and it generates new knowledge to fill a knowledge gap. What I mean by that is research is studying a novel idea or something that has not been done. An example might be testing whether or not a new drug treats a certain type of cancer. This is producing new information. Evidence-based practice, on the other hand, is using information and research that's already been done and implementing it into practice. For research, the results are generalizable, and it does require review by the Institutional Review Board, or IRB. The IRB, it's, it's an administrative body that has been established to protect the rights and welfare of human research subjects that are recruited to participate in different research activities or studies. Note, though, Research utilization is the results from a single study to inform practice decision. Lastly, translational research studies how evidence-based interventions are translated into real-world settings. So all these definitions are important to know, but primarily what I want you to get out of this is understanding the real difference between evidence-based practice and research. Quality improvement is also very different from evidence-based practice. Quality improvement utilizes a, system, a systematic process uh, and certain quality improvement models such as PDSA and PDCA. Um, they use these processes to identify and address issues within the organization. 
They look at structures and processes to identify issues that are impending quality and safety. And they use internal evidence to identify and track trends. The results are not generalizable and they're primarily just used for that certain type of organization. Typically, it does not require an institutional review board. This chart right here, titled EBP, Organizational Culture and, and Environment, talks about the context of caring. And really, it goes back to those three pillars that we talked about. Utilizing EBP, clinical expertise, and patient preferences and values to make a clinical decision, ultimately improving patient outcomes and quality. So really, it's, it's a science and it's an art to develop the best clinical decision-making tool to improve quality outcomes. The goal of evidence-based practice we've touched on briefly, but there's the quadruple aim, meaning there's four things that we want to touch on when we're deciding to use EBP. And they are improved patient experience, improved outcomes, cost reduction, and organizational driven, which often includes such things as joy in work, uh, clinician expertise, equitability, and organizational readiness. Evidence-based practice all helps us get there and ultimately helps us get to that quadruple aim. One of the primary goals and initiatives to advance evidence-based practice was put forth by the Institute of Medicines or ION Roundtable on EBP. They put forth that by the year of 2020, 90% of clinical decisions will be supported by evidence. And unfortunately, we're already there at year 2020, and we know that's not true. And one of the biggest barriers, which we'll talk about later, is the fact that we've always done it that way. And you're going to hear that a lot throughout, throughout this class. We've always done it that way. So we're not necessarily going to change, or we're not going to look at the best evidence, and we're not going to use the evidence that's out there to make change happen. So unfortunately, we're already at 2020, and we're not there. But... There's other key initiatives to advance evidence-based practice, and they're listed here. These are different groups that are all working on advancing this practice. So we know evidence-based practice is important. We know why it's important, and we know the differences between EVP, QI, and research. Now let's dive into the steps of the EVP process, and this isn't going to be the first time that you're going to see these. And in fact, part of this class is actually de uh, the development of a project and going through these different steps. So the first step, zero, is cultivating a spirit of inquiry within the environment. And really what that is, is developing an idea or something out there that needs EBP implementation. Step one, then, is asking the burning clinical question in PICO format. So it's what question do we want to get at to address this issue? And we'll talk a lot more about the PICO format. Step two is research for and collect the most relevant best evidence. Step three is critically appraising the evidence and there's different tools that we'll use to do this. Step four is integrating the best evidence with one's clinical expertise and patient preferences and values in making a decision, practice decision or change. Step five is evaluating outcomes of change. And finally, step six is disseminating the outcomes of evidence-based change out into the real world. There's different barriers and facilitators that can either help us get to that endpoint of dissemination or stop us from ever getting to that point. Within healthcare organizations and settings where care is provided, both barriers and facilitators exist, and they all influence the uptake and sustainability of EBP. Practitioners must learn how to overcome these barriers and leverage the facilitators to order and implement EBP. Again, it's a team, so we have to have those facilitators. Organizational barriers, facilitators, culture, and readiness for system-wide implementation of EBP should be assessed prior to ultimately starting the EBP process, but also when you get to the end, all these barriers and facilitators should be addressed through the process up until the end of disseminating the project and implementing it. Examples of barriers to EBP include lack of administrative or management support, resistance to change, which is a big one, as we all know, misperceptions or negative attitudes about EBP, meaning change is not a bad thing. We have to have change to better the world. And I think it's really as simple as that. 
So it's it's identifying these mis you know this misper these misperceptions or negative attitudes and trying to change those using your facilitators. There's also a lack of EBP knowledge and skills, a lack of time and resources, which is another big thing, and lack of EBP EBP mentors, which hopefully at the end, at the end of this class you guys will all be EBP mentors. There are different strategies out there to eliminate barriers to using EBP, and they include establishing a clear philosophy and organizational vision in which EBP is valued and expected, developing a strategic plan to create a culture and environment that fosters EBP, dispelling misperceptions about EBP, teaching the basics of EBP, encouraging questions about currently used clinical practice, practices, and developing EBP mentors. Lastly, we're gonna review examples of facilitators of EBP. These examples include support and encouragement from the administration and management teams, EBP mentors with excellent EBP skills, knowledge, and proficiency in individual and organizational change strategies, evidence-based policies and procedures, EBP education, proper integration of EBP into health professionals curricula, proper tools to assist with and support EBP, and finally, EBP councils. All right, so we made it through the first quick blitz of EBP for week one. I'm gonna to try to do these for each week, but as always, please don't hesitate to reach out to me with any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you.